Michael Reeves wrote or co-wrote nine Star Wars novels between 2001 and 2013, but he was also a prolific screenwriter for animated series. To name a few, he was the head writer for Batman the Animated Series, Gargoyles, and Spider-Man Unlimited. His first Star Wars novel, Darth Maul Shadowhunter, made it to number nine on the New York Times bestseller list for two separate weeks. For the week of February 18th and the week of March 4th, 2001, and was ultimately on the list for four weeks. Now I'm pretty certain that I never read Darth Maul Saboteur, Lucino's short story before, but I believe that I did read Shadowhunter back when it was originally released. The setting of Coruscant's underworld felt very familiar, but I had retained pretty much no memory of any of the plot points. So a brief summary. After years of waiting in the shadows, Darth Sidious secretly meets with the Trade Federation to plan the blockade of Naboo. But one of the Nemodians is missing, so Sidious dispatches his apprentice, Darth Maul, to hunt the traitor down. News of the Trade Federation's plan leaks to two people, information broker Lorne Pavan and Jedi Padawan Darsha Asant. But little do they know that they'll be facing off against one of the deadliest killers in the galaxy. If you go into Darth Maul Shadow Hunter expecting more information about Darth Maul, knowledge of his backstory, his entire history up to this point, you will be disappointed. I don't blame Reeves because I suspect that Lucasfilm put some sort of embargo on the history of Maul, Insidious, and the Sith. At this point in time, Lucas was finishing up work on Attack of the Clones and was probably getting started with Revenge of the Sith, so obviously they didn't want to release information that would later be changed and rewritten. So while we hear that Sidious has trained Maul since practically birth, we don't get a lot more than that. Maul is still a shadowy figure here. He's unquestionably loyal to Sidious. He will do whatever he asks, and he believes in the supremacy and the right of the Sith. And we know that Sidious has been planning events for decades at this point that his final game plan is obviously the destruction of the Jedi Order, but a lot of his goals are still nebulous at this point. So I'd argue that Maul isn't a particularly complex character. He's hugely competent, he's good at what he does, and what he does is evil and violence and killing people and fulfilling the will of his master, but there's not any conflict within Maul, more that he wants to see this job through to its conclusion and it ends up being perhaps more difficult than he initially imagined. The Nemodians of the Trade Federation that Darth Sidious is dealing with are Nemodians. They lie about everything. They're huge cowards, but one of them decides that he'd rather take an opportunity to sell this information to the highest bidder, then carry out the plan. And so that's why Darth Maul's dispatched in the first place to find the traitor, to find Mon Char and kill him and make sure that no one else has uncovered the knowledge of the upcoming blockade of Naboo. Of course, this wouldn't be a story unless some people cover that knowledge. And so we have Lorne Pavin, the information broker, his protocol droid partner, I-5, and then eventually Darsha Asant and her master. Lorne has a complicated backstory with the Jedi. As the story progresses, we learn more about it because at first all we know is he hates the Jedi. We discover that he had worked for the Jedi, that he had a young child who was force sensitive, was taken from him, but because of how the Jedi view attachments, Lorne wasn't able to keep his employment with the Jedi. They essentially took his son and fired him, and he has a lot of grief and anger inside over that situation. Lorne's definitely a scoundrel type. I think being a Corellian, he almost can't help being a scoundrel type. I mean, a lot of them are like that. He wants 
to be prosperous. He wants money. He does some morally questionable things, but when push comes to shove, he also does the right thing. He knows that this is important information, it should be taken to the Jedi or to the Senate. And while he thinks about weaseling his way out multiple times, he does in the end try to make sure that someone knows what is going to happen. I liked I-5. I like droids who have developed their own personality, and I-5 definitely has his own personality. Lorne views him as a business partner, as an equal partner. They don't have the master-servant relationship that a lot of droids have, but he relies on I-5, I-5's ideas, what I-5 can come up with, and I-5 is also not the most lawful individual because he hacks into the banking system and steals a bunch of credits. But he's also loyal to Lorne and knows that the information they have is important. And Darsha's an interesting character. She's presumably around the same age as Obi-Wan Kenobi. She's friends with him and she's excited to do her Jedi trials to move on to the next stage of her training to become an actual knight. But she's also unsure of herself. I think a lot of that devolves on how the mission she was supposed to undertake for her Jedi trials goes so horribly wrong. She second guesses herself, she doesn't think that she's strong enough, that she's learned enough, and she struggles at time to really immerse herself in the Force to let herself completely go. I got a much better sense of Darsha from the book than I did of her master, Master Bandara, but I think that's because we spend a lot more time with Darsha. What we know of Bandara is that he is... What we know of Bandara is that he thinks a lot of Darsha, he thinks that she's capable of rising to the challenge, but he also thinks that the mission the Jedi have assigned her for her trials is perhaps too much for someone of her skill level and age to tackle. He's willing to help her when she's in trouble, needs help, and he's also willing to sacrifice himself to save Darsha and the other people they've encountered. Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi also show up briefly. Obi-Wan Kenobi is actually assigned to find out what happened to Darsha after she doesn't return from her mission with the Black Sun informant as the Jedi Council requested. Obi-Wan is like 10 steps behind Darsha and he knows there's something going on. He knows that something bad happened to Master Bandara and eventually to Darsha herself, but he's never able to uncover what precisely because he and Qui-Gon Jinn are called off to Naboo to the blockade instead. So the investigation that happens here, I'll get into this a little later, no one else finds out what Darsha and Lord learned and it's sad in a way because they tried to accomplish something huge and immense and no one will ever know. Like, like Outbound Flight, which is another one of the prequels books where characters do something, make a huge sacrifice, and no one ever learns what they did. So going into Darth Maul's Shadowhunter, I found the beginning a little slow. There's some setup in place, mostly on the part of Darsha and Master Bondari, to get Darsha at the right place where she can encounter Lorne and I-5 and get caught up in this mission to bring the information about the Trade Federation to the Jedi or to the Senate. And I found until she met up with Lorne and I-5 that it felt a little slow to me. She's dispatched to get a Black Sun informant. Everything goes horribly wrong. She heads back but she doesn't have the informant. Master Bandara goes with her to see if the man is still alive. He's presumably not, and they get caught up into this whole debacle. Likewise, Lorne is trying to buy a holocron from a Toydarian. He is double-crossed by the Toydarian because he ticks him off. 
And then he's out a lot of money and he's on the hook with the hut who expected to purchase the holocron. So until Lauren and I-5 encounter Darth Maul, they're like on a completely separate plot line as well. But once Lauren meets with the Nemodian, heads to meet with the Nemodian again and finds the slaughter that Darth Maul created, gets that holocron and then encounters Darsha, I felt the story really took off from there. With Shadowhunter, you know that they're not going to be able to tell this information to anyone because then the plot of the Phantom Menace would have never occurred. Either that or the Senate and the Jedi are just completely incompetent to learn that the Trade Federation is planning a blockade and then just to allow it to happen. So in Shadowhunter, it's less, will they be able to get to the Jedi and get them the information in time and more, oh no, how will this go wrong? Which, you know, sometimes I don't enjoy reading that. I don't enjoy reading something where the conclusion is known from the beginning of the story because it just feels pointless, like what they accomplished is nothing. But I felt like here the pace was so good and I did get interested in Darsha and Lauren's stories that every time it was like, will they be able to stay ahead of Darth Maul? I know eventually he'll catch them. And then how will they go? And for Darsha, it was that she sacrificed herself to save Lauren and I-5. And for Lauren, it was that he finally thought he got the information to someone who could help. But as the reader, as someone who has outside knowledge of the Star Wars universe, it's a gut-wrenching moment when he, you think he's gotten to safety and he's like, oh, thank you so much, Senator Palpatine. You're just like, oh man, oh, you dead now. You're gonna die and no one will find this out. Which is funny because I felt like the novelization of The Phantom Menace didn't use that connection where you as the viewer know that Palpatine is Darth Sidious, but here the knowledge that Palpatine has another agenda, that Palpatine looks kindly but is bad, makes what happens to Lord so gut-wrenching that he thought he had accomplished what he set out to do. He thought that he had found justice for Darsha, but instead he came to the absolute worst person he could have turned to. And poor I-5, Lorne hands him off to a, like, underworld acquaintance that says, get the destroyed to the Jedi Council, he has important information they need to know, and that guy's like, sure. And then five minutes later, it's like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm gonna sell him and wipe his memory. So even that, the, like, the one other way that the Jedi could have found out is foiled. So everything that Darsha and Lorne and I-5 did in the end was for naught. I really liked the setting here. It gave me very much a film noir feeling. I think because we spend so much time in the underworld of Coruscant that this is not the glittering spires we see in The Phantom Menace. There's gangs, there's violence. And I think that's partially how Darth Maul is able to go on a killing spree and no one really notices because it's the underworld. You just expect stuff like that to happen. I did wonder, though, why no one really was picking up on Darth Maul's murder spree, especially because Lorn walks into the room where Monchar, the Nemodian, was killed. Darth Maul decapitates him. And he just looks at the scene, looks at what happened. Basically, Darth Maul decapitated him. The bounty hunter showed up. She, like, shot off a rocket. Everything got all messed up. But he can look at it and go, I think that was a lightsaber. And then he and I-5 are like, okay, either we've got a rogue Jedi running around or there's a Sith. But the Sith are extinct. But a lightsaber. And people see Master Bondara fighting with Maul. But somehow this news of a Sith on Coruscant never trickles out to the, the Jedi or other people until Maul's appearance on Tatooine. And then they're like, oh, there's a Sith? And I felt a little bit like, but he's been killing people 
for a bit now. And I mean, maybe it was because he was killing people in places where it would go unnoticed or the law enforcement just wouldn't put the necessary effort in to find out what happened. But it did feel a little bit like for a book called Darth Maul Shadowhunter, Darth Maul was being really obvious in parts. I did wonder at times if Darth Maul was too easily foiled along the way by Lorne and by I-5 and by Darsha. He's supposedly one of the greatest swordsmen ever. He has all this training. When we first encounter him in the book, he's fighting against these combat droids and he takes them out in a matter of like 30 seconds. But I guess I could buy it a little better because Maul is so rigid in his thinking. He thinks he's so better than everyone else that he almost underestimates everyone he encounters. When he duels Darsha towards the end, he thinks that she's just feebly trying to use the force to throw items at him, not knowing that she has a plan and that the plan depends on her sacrificing herself to save others. I think more than anything, Shadowhunter shows that Darth Maul may have all this training, but that the real world has the ability to flummox him, that people don't always behave how he expects them to, and that's his weakness, that he thinks he knows everything because the Sith cause is right, his master is right, but in fact, he's been almost sheltered and hasn't encountered just the ingenuity of people around him. And I guess in keeping with a film noir story, there's like a romantic element here. It's like an unrequited romantic element, but we reach a certain point in the story where while initially Lorne hated the Jedi and uh, didn't want anything to do with the Jedi, now he's like, oh, but I do find this one Jedi woman very attractive and she like feels the same way and nothing ever comes of it because she sacrifices herself and then by the end, he's dead too. But I felt a little like that was unnecessary, or if it wasn't unnecessary, just that while I could see the attraction on Lorne's side because Darsha's a young woman, she's attractive, she's kind, she's good at what she does, I like couldn't see the attraction on Darsha's part. There's definitely an age difference there because Darsha's like, you know, maybe early to mid 20s. And I don't know how old Lorne is, but he's got a son who's like seven now, I think. But also Darsha has been raised within the Jedi Order where attachments are something that are absolutely a no-go. So I'm not sure that like that two-sided attraction would have occurred and it feels somewhat unnecessary to me. Like it's one aspect of the story that I felt like could have been excised pretty easily and wouldn't have taken anything away. I think it's enough for Lorne to spend time with Darsha and be like, you know, not all the Jedi are what I thought they were. Some Jedi are good and trying to help and nice, kind people without adding in a like unrequited they're both dead by the end romance as well. So in short, I thought that Darth Maul Shadowhunter was like a fun noir adventure in the prequel era. Darsha and Lauren's fates are pretty much a foregone conclusion from the beginning. You know they won't get this information to everyone. So I think the interesting part is more following how things go wrong how they're able to sidestep Maul most of the time, and then how Maul is able to beat them in the end. There were some elements here I didn't enjoy, the romance I didn't enjoy, and I thought the beginning was slow. But you know, for initially not being a Darth Maul fan at all, I still thought this was an enjoyable read. So next time I'm going to be reading James Lucino's political prequel to The Phantom Menace, Cloak of Deception.
So sunburn update. It's getting better. It's a lot less red, but it still doesn't feel good.